Welcome to another episode of Badass Banking, and today on Crossing the Pond with Fiona Roach Canning. And she's with a company called Pollinate. You do pronounce it Pollinate, right? We do. How else might you might? I, I don't know. When I think of pollination, I think of my allergies. That's why. And my allergies right now are doing very well. So Fiona, tell us a little about, we were talking off camera about your experience in New York, five years here in the U.S. So, so you know what's going on with the U.S. economy. I'm sure you're probably still connected very much with, with our people here and some of the brands here. Um, are, is, is the British economy and the um, U.S. economy going through kind of the same thing right now as far as recessionary headwinds? Brian, first, thanks so much for having me today. Delighted to talk to an American and lovely to hear the accent again. Um, yeah, I think in terms of economy, the economies are pretty similar. It's going to be pretty tough, I think, for consumers on both sides of the pond over the next few years. The energy prices, the cost of living crisis, you're seeing hits to consumer confidence and just a tightening of spending and far less discretionary income all around. So definitely, I think, going to be a pretty hard time on both sides of the pond. Yeah, tell me a little about Pollinate and the genesis of Pollinate. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for asking. Uh, so it was back in 2017, which is five years ago now. And uh, NatWest Bank, the CEO of NatWest Bank, who was Ross McEwen at the time, was interested to get back into payments. And uh, for those of you who don't know, as part of the global financial crisis, NatWest had to divest its payments business um, almost overnight. And every customer that came to the bank and said, I'd like to take payments, they passed the lead on to WorldPay and didn't get anything back in return. So NatWest was looking to go back into payments. And the question he posed to us was, how would you do it with a blank sheet of paper? Which is an amazing question to be posed. So we looked at everything. We looked at joint ventures with fintechs. We looked at building payments infrastructure. We looked at who you target. Is it the corporates or enterprises? Is it the micros? Is it the SMEs? And we came back with the recommendation that SMEs are really interesting. They are historically underserved. And what they need is integrated digital experiences. So don't spend your time building payments infrastructure. Instead, free up your data to create lovely customer experiences for your SME audiences, serve them well, and not only are you doing a really, really good thing for communities around the world and societies around the world to which SMEs are the cornerstones, right? Your butcher, your corner store, your wine merchant, but also there's, there's a lot of value to be had from serving SMEs well. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I, I had mentioned off camera that SMEs are very you know, dear to me. Uh, I, I feel passionately that banks can do so much more for small business. Uh, I, I know a lot of small business owners through some of the nonprofits I work with, as well as I live in a small community of Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, an original British colony, by the way. And you know, I can tell you that the local merchants here are grossly underserved and increasingly are turning away from uh, uh, business banks or community banks and are seeking alternatives with fintechs. Uh, American Express, for example, has done a brilliant job of capturing market share. You were about to say something. Well, I, I was going to say what we see here is, is similar with a slight nuance. So we, we now work to finish the Pollinate story. So we, um, we went live with NatWest. We um, are the technology provider for Till by NatWest. We then took the idea to Australia um, with NAB Hive and we're soon to go live in Canada. So we, we are already working across the world and also looking at Brazil, South Africa, and most importantly, the US. But what we see almost everywhere is small businesses still want to go to their bank first, and they often do. They still have that trust and that, that feeling that your business bank is the one that should help you with a business loan or a business plan. Um, but often then the experience means that they end up taking the loan they need from a fintech because they can get it more quickly and more, more easily. I need to introduce you to Jill Castilla, the CEO of Citizens Bank of Edmonds, Oklahoma, not to be confused with the one in Rhode Island that originally was part of RBS that I'm sure you're familiar with. She's got a passion for uh, small business 
And she did a deal uh, two years ago with Mark Cuban and Tesla Software um, that was really unique. Again, putting money in the pockets of the SMEs that really needed it, that really did want to get that help from their banks. The first thing, as you mentioned, is the small business uh, owners, the middle market owners and business uh, people do look at the traditional financial institutions as their first lifeline. But again, increasingly, uh, if the banks are not there for them at time of need uh, or aren't developing the intimate relationships with them, we are seeing increasingly here in the U.S. Um, uh, this displacement is occurring and the, the non, the non banks or the neo banks are starting to gather some market share. Now you guys recently published a, uh, a white paper and I'm reading the paper, uh, the name of it right now. It's SMEs banking's inflection point. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And, and I think you published it today and today is I have to check my counter August 30th. So I, I know we're going to be, I'm going to be helping you guys get that out in the news here. I believe it's in the financial brand already. Uh, I know Jeffrey Pilcher at the financial brand and uh, Jim Roos quite well. I don't know if you know them personally, but I'll, I'll be sure to introduce you to them as well. Um, so now we understand a little about the genesis behind the brand and what you're doing. Tell me about um, you know, the U.S. market. What, what's the interest in the U.S. market all about? You said you're particularly interested in, uh, in, in North America. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Thank you. And I'd love to meet Jill. I'd love to meet anyone in the US or around the world with a with a passion for serving SMEs because, you know, you can have a financial reason for running a business. But at the end of the day, if you don't believe in the end community you're serving, then what's the point? So, yes, any, any introductions to anybody and everybody who's passionate about SMEs. Um, and I should say SMB in the US, shouldn't I, rather than SME? I just say small business. Small but business. In, but the problem is when you say small business, people get concerned about, like, well, what is that? Is that revenue under a million? Is that revenue under five? So it's maybe it's just SMEs or SMBs. It doesn't matter. But but why the US was your question. I mean, the, the US is a fascinating market from a payments perspective, isn't it? And um and a small business perspective. I lived in New York for five years, so I've firsthand seen the the differences between uh the UK and Australia and other markets that we work in and the US. And it's fascinating. When I moved there, I, I joked with my husband, if we were moving to Japan, we would have studied the language and read cultural guides and probably gone to classes. We moved to the US overnight thinking, oh, they speak the same language. It'll be exactly the same. And I remember the horrible shock we had when we tried to do our taxes, never mind trying to open a bank account or um, send a payment to, to a friend. Although that's, that's now much better than many other markets around the world with Venmo. Um, you guys have really jumped, jumped the markets there. I'm a but, big user. I'm a big user of Square. I love what Square has done, not only for consumers with the, with the, the Cash App, but with, with small business. You know, their payment solution is actually pretty brilliant. Well, I mean, we, we will come back to the U.S. in a minute, but Square, I think, is the one of the companies that really made banks wake up and say, oh, my goodness, we have a burning platform. We really need to get this right now. And what Square is doing really well with the Cash App is they're trying to create that closed loop ecosystem. Yeah. So not only are they serving the SMBs with payments, but they're also getting consumers on board. And they, they purchased Afterpay for, I think, $29 billion, if I remember rightly. And they didn't purchase them for the buy now, pay later functionality. That's That's been around for ages. That's installment payments. Right. They purchased them for the fact that they originate from their consumer base, a million transactions a day to businesses. And so what Square is doing really well is it's trying to build up this community of SMBs and this community of consumers that can then interact in this lovely closed loop ecosystem. And actually, another, uh, another one of my favorite um, payment companies is Shopify. And I don't know if you use the Shopify app. I do. Um, yeah. So I thought that was brilliant as well, because they said, oh, download our app and you can track when your deliveries are coming. Yeah. And I was like, oh, brilliant. That's a great consumer benefit. I'll do that. But then you now see, oh, here's some shops you love and here's some products you love. And then below it, here's some products you might love. And again, they're trying to build that ecosystem of Shopify is the first place I go when I want to buy something. Yeah. And you know, why are we passionate about this space? Because it's evolving so fast and because the future isn't about who can do payments better and who can do acquiring better. 
it's who can see the future and the way the business model is changing to bring together the advertising business models and how you attract eyeballs and how you get transactions from consumers. And the payments almost become an invisible integral part of that. One of the stats I love is that um, SMBs and larger companies pay 10 times for the eyeballs what they pay for the payments. So in the US, I think it's about 3% for a payment, but they're paying 30% to the likes of Google or Meta or Amazon in terms of getting the advertising to get that customer 10 times the amount. So the future, the future in this space is the people who take those two business models and crash it together. It's, yeah. not, it's not about getting payments right anymore. I agreed 100%. It's almost like a... Um... It's a type of ecosystem that's very consumer centric or very small uh, small business centric. So, so are are traditional banks, in your opinion, really missing a huge opportunity here? They're not right now. They're not right now because they still have huge customer bases. Right? They have all of the assets under management, and they they are going to have those for a while, but. Traditional banks are product businesses. And as much as they really, really try to be experience-based businesses, they are stuck in those silos for, for historical reasons, because of the legacy tech, because they can't free up their data. There's a lot of reasons that is the case. But often when a traditional bank says it's going experience first, it'll put a lovely experience around a single product area. Right. It's not truly about going horizontal. And a really, really good example of that, um, that hasn't happened yet in the US, but has happened in other parts around the world, when, when interchange was regulated. And in the UK, it's now, I think, 20 basis points for debit and 30 basis points for credit. You heard me right. Very, very small. All of the loyalty programs that used to try and encourage credit card usage at banks disappeared overnight because it was all funded by the interchange. Now, that doesn't mean retail consumers are bad for banks, but it was all managed between within that individual product silo. And, and that's true of everything. It's true of the way they try and serve small businesses as well. And there are loads of brilliant people in banks who are trying to be customer first, who are trying to be experience led, but it goes against the whole organization st structure, the culture, the access to data of a bank. Oh, I, couldn't, I, think, I couldn't agree more. I mean, th those silos have existed since the 1980s. I, you know, I've, I've experienced every aspect of my career in the bank and in the fintech industry. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I, I another, hope they get, I hope they improve at some point. And I think as we evolve to be more consumer centric, uh, hopefully they will improve. Well, I think SMEs, when you're serving SMBs, um, they are consumers at their heart, right? They're, they're like you and me, you, you right. have a business. I've had small businesses in the past. And so our expectations of our banks are the expectations we have of consumer companies. And so I don't know what your favorites are, but if you take the entertainment space or the healthcare space, you've now got your Netflix that encourages you to binge watch because it knows you so well. Yep. You've got your TikTok that you can accidentally lose three hours of your life without realizing because within 20 minutes, it knows exactly what to serve you next. Um, I mean, in health, uh, Nike running or Peloton, there's so many examples of companies that yeah. use data and they create really personalized experiences. And that is now my expectation of, um, of my bank and of financial services. I, I often tell bankers when they ask me, what is, you know, what do you think our greatest threat is? I said, it's changing consumer sentiment, you know, mobile, smart, smart devices and consumer companies or the Pelotons of the world. By the way, my wife just hit her 3,000th ride, which is a big deal. They did a shout out from the... Life? Yeah, I think she wants to do the London studio while we're going to be in London. In I, I've just hit my 3,000th... Oh, I might buy a Peloton one day. All right. Experience. Yeah, well, talk to her. She'll get you a better deal and she gets some kind of points. Um, but, you know, the... the um, the, con the consumer is in intimately involved with brands like Peloton, but I don't think consumers are intimately involved with Bank of America or, um, you know, Citizens Bank. And, and I think a lot of the reason for that is bankers have failed to realize that, that the data that they have can be utilized for good. And they can use that data to create a different level of intimacy. They can predict need. You know, you mentioned uh, Netflix is an example. You know, Netflix, it always knows what I want to watch next. TikTok, same thing. Instagram, 
you know, they drive me crazy because you're right. We lose hours and hours looking at these devices and people wonder what's happening to us as a society. It's because we're looking at our things like that. But yeah. Um, so what can banks do uh, better with regards to data and how can they use data to, you know, in, in reduce the silos and become more consumer centric? It's a great question. And look, I think there are some great examples of banks doing things really well out there. Um, on, on the US side, on again, on the consumer side, I think what Goldman Sachs have done with Marcus is great. I think what Chase have done with their um, consumer account is really good. I literally opened it within 90 seconds on my phone between subway stations. I mean, it's, it's excellent. I think with the data, da data is terrifying, right? Because we have a lot of regulation around data and, and banks, the reason people trust banks is because they have the governance and they have the regulation and they do use data correctly. But that means there are departments of people whose job it is to say no to anything anybody might want to do with data. And so one of the things as Pollinate we do is pe people think of us as a payments company, but we're not. What we are is really a data company. We help banks give us the data um, and, and third parties give us the data, just the data we need to be able to then curate brilliant data, digital experiences from that data. And because our data platform was built in 2017, we have the same advantage fintechs do, that you build it with privacy at its heart. You build it compliant with GDPR or APRA or whatever the relevant legislation is in that country. And so then if an SME says to you, I want to be forgotten, that's the click of a button. It's not a panicked phone call between five departments trying to work out where all the different data is held. And when we work with banks around the world, that's that's one of the things they really love about us. They We can actually help them free up their data. And then you can use that data to power really wonderful uh, digital experiences for SMEs. Yeah, I mean, ex experiences are where the future lies. Again, you know, the experiences that we have with these consumer brands kind of define our relationship with those brands. They drive the loyalty. They drive the passionate. I don't know if we'll ever be passionate about any aspect of a banking experience, but certainly we will be more loyal, loyal to the relationships that are centric to our needs, right? So that means data and product have to be aligned. One of the things most frustrating for me as a, as a business person, as well as a consumer is, my bank, where I have a considerable relationship, it's a $25 billion US bank, regional bank, as we call it here. They constantly send me offers for products I already have with them. It, yep. It's maddening. And, and it, I'm, I'm too lazy, as is probably the ma vast majority of Americans, to change my account. Now, that said, you know, the likes of Betterment come along and Betterment throws out a great uh, APY, you know, awesome yield, although awesome is... is to be determined because it's only 1.6, but my bank's only often half a percent right now. And with a click or two, that money left union and went right over to Betterment, just like that. And I'm making five times the annual yield. So they are making it, these fintechs and some of the smarter banks, you mentioned Chase, they are making it easier to move money and or relationships from place A to place B or even more. Um, the other thing that's maddening for me is I've got um, several PFM kind of relationships, personal financial management relationships through banks and fintechs, third parties. It could be a move and it could be, you know, uh, a Jack Henry or an MX. And it always says when I when I go into that PFM experience, it always says your net worth is, well, here's the problem. They don't know what percentage of the accounts, if any, I've aggregated. So they really don't know my net worth. So I, I really have a problem. Well, with, well, maybe they do and you're just disappointed every time you log in. No, I, well, I'm not that disappointed because I mean, these numbers, some of the numbers, I, one of them I had uh, when I set up my first Betterment account, it said my net worth was only what I had in the Betterment account, which I think was uh, you know 80 grand or something like that. And as I increased it, I saw the net worth, their version of net worth go up. Finally, I aggregated a couple more accounts, and then then I saw that bump in the in the uh, net worth. But they still don't know what really is outside that environment. They don't know what I've actually aggregated. So it's the but that's, that's where you've got to get the value exchange right, right? Ex exactly. Um, I've got to appreciate the value of giving them more access to more of my data. Exactly, and, or, and one or of the they need to 
or they need to encourage it somehow or incentive. Exactly. Yeah. No, one, uh, we have a couple of examples in that space. So one of the one of the products we have for SMBs is the ability for them to run their own ad tech stack, essentially. So run it off the payments data. You can create loyalty programs for all of your customers. So reward them for coming and buying coffees for you or coming and getting their groceries from you or whatever, and then send offers to get more customers. And one of the reasons that works for us to do it off the payment data is otherwise an SMB has the Seinfeld fat wallet problem. I don't know if you've seen right. that. Oh, so. yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like that. I know. Um, and so you've got to get the value exchange right, because otherwise you're saying to a consumer, give me all of this really personal data about yourself. And in six months time, we might give you a free coffee or we might give you a free appetizer. Right. Whereas you run it off the payments data, you do it for multiple SMBs at the same time. And then for me as a consumer, it's like, oh, I've already got a free haircut or a free coffee or 10% off this. It, so with, with everything, with the exchange of data, it's always about getting that value exchange right. Yep. The, other, the other example we have is um, in open banking. And I know this isn't so relevant in the US now, but we, we built um, an open banking payment initiation service for NatWest. We're also um, working down in Brazil at the moment as well on their open banking infrastructure. And you've got to incentivize consumers to use it because actually payment cards and cash work really, really well for a consumer. And so even though in Brazil, you're going to be paid maybe 30 times faster as a merchant. So there's a massive benefit to you. You've got to get the benefit and the incentive there on the consumer side as well, or nothing works. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. So we spent some time chatting. Uh, we do have to wrap it up pretty soon. Let's let's shift back to the company and in the United States. So you're you're doing some expansion in the U.S., could you tell us a little more about the U.S. plans and what you hope to accomplish? Yeah, of course. So our, our mission is to put together a global alliance of like-minded banks, all committed to serving SMBs. And we're already working in multiple countries around the world, but a big focus for us is the U.S. because you are such a large but fascinating market. And also because the sweet spot of bank that we think we can work with in, U in the U.S. is the regional bank that you mentioned. Um, because you are benefiting from a broader global perspective and uh, a broader uh, mindset from working with multiple banks. So we're already working with a couple of banks in the US. We'd love to work with many more. We've established ourselves down there. We'll be at Money 2020 um, and would love to talk to many banks there as well. I'll, um, I'll be there. Maybe we can uh, arrange like a cocktail hour for some of our uh, joint clients. That'd be that'd be kind of interesting. That would be wonderful. That would be very nice. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been great talking uh, with you. I'd like to share your white paper, if that's okay. And and if you don't mind, I'm going to I'm going in the video and also on Spotify. I'll, I'll uh, provide a link to your LinkedIn profile so people can reach out if they'd like to learn more. I have a number of banks that you ought to be talking to. A number of fintech. Uh, I don't know if they're influencers or or just. Um, um, really interesting, open-minded fintech banking types that you should be talking to in the U.S. I'll be sure to tag a couple of those as we as we post more about Pollinate and all that you guys are doing. I really appreciate uh, your time today. Any last words you'd like to mention? Just that if you are in the U.S. or any other market, I'm passionate about SMBs and would love to know how we can help you free up your data to create amazing digital experiences. Please do give us a call or drop us a line. We'd be delighted to chat. Uh, it's a fascinating topic and there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm glad to see that there are other people out there that are passionate about the opportunity that exists. You know, banking is changing very, very quickly. And in the perception of the consumer and or the small business owner, uh, it is also changing. The competition's nipping them in the bud and the, the option of doing nothing is not an option. Things are gonna have to change. Again, appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing you at Money 2020 or at least the team. It's lovely talking to you, Brian. Thank you so much.